What exactly is the big deal with organic? Is it really worth the extra cost? It definitely is, and this is the reason why. Is that What I'm just simply trying to tell you is that as an auntie, I don't like to see nobody get hurt, okay? Interesting each other. Again, it's the same type of things that I just mentioned that the parents could be asking. So How are you guys doing? I'm Ty Smith, Modern Renaissance Man, and this is going to be a video that's going to go on my church slash God topics. And what I'm going to talk about today in this particular case that I've talked about with quite a few people and they've been asking me questions about is this particular topic of what I've heard thrown around a lot of church a lot is like this cliche word of prodigal son. I get that a lot. I get that a lot on my channel. I get that a lot when people talk to me. You know, you go and preach at a church or something like that. And the first thing a lot of people want to do, they want to come at me and they want to say, you know, pray for my son or pray for my daughter because she's backslidden or he's backslidden. Or they say, I have a prodigal son or I have a prodigal daughter. And the thing is, is that I know that it's going to end up causing them to kind of get a little, first of all, a little surprised, a little upset and a little mad. And it's because of this. I tell them there's no such thing. You know, and what I mean by we know we we grow up in church and we hear these terms and we just adapt to what these terms mean. Like, OK, let's say, for instance, my first two or three years in church, I learned through conversation and through hearing different people talk. If somebody stopped coming to the church building, they say, oh, well, you know, they probably backslid. Or then why are they going when people are praying? Like we have a day where there was a there was a day devoted to prayer. They would say, you know, pray for my son, I have a prodigal. And then, like I told you, if I go and preach at a church or I go talk to a group of people that's, you know, group of Christians in certain uh, different surroundings, that like can be their home, it can be like at a different place. They'll say, you know, brother, can you pray for me and my child? I have a prodigal son. And it messes them up because I come at them with a different approach. I say, you know, you don't have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. There was only one prodigal son, a prodigal daughter that was mentioned in the Bible. And let's just leave that at that. You know, so I say, if one, I tell them this, we have to quit throwing around so many church cliches. You know what I mean? That's just like a, it's just, one, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to get this to, for you guys to understand it, but people just do that. The minute you, you don't see somebody come to a church building or you don't see them at church, you instantly assume that they backslid or you instantly assume that we throw this church terminology around saying that they are prodigal. Now, the reason why I'm saying all this is this, if you raise your child, on the oracles of God, the principles of God, they know everything they need to, you know, pretty much you raise them about Jesus and all that. When they become of a certain age and decide not to come to, to church no more or to the church building no more, you instantly call them a backslider. You call them prodigal. And I tell people, I said this, I said, just be careful with that because you don't know if your child, you know, if you taught them the oracles of God and the principles of God, that child, which they're probably most of the time when they tell me it's their son or something like that, the person is like 19, 20, 21. Some of them are even married and got kids. You know, we actually we, we I'm not going to say the name, of course, but we actually had a pastor of a church. Him and his wife was actually trying to get me and my wife to so-called get their children back in church. You know, we invited them over and had dinner. We talked with them. But the thing is that we didn't we, they, we, when we talked. It wasn't like what the pastor and his wife thought we were going to talk about. We talked about things about life. We talked about random things. We talked about, you know, family and and marriage and relationships and how to handle kids and all this and next thing you know we found ourselves we did talk about spiritual spiritual things but we was coming to town oh my god i'm like these people are they don't you know you would think that they went to church every day according to the conversation so what i'm saying all that for is this i got you know i, I get a lot of this oh because it, it it throws them off when i tell them you know, your son is doing OK or your daughter is doing OK. I had a life alone conversation with them. Oh, so they're going to come back to church. Well, they never been out of church. Now, you might not have seen them at the church building 
or what you consider to be church, but they have not, you know, they still talk about the God. They got a relationship with him. They talk about, oh man, I was talking to the Lord the other day and da da da, da and he impressed upon me. So I'm hearing these conversations from these so-called prodigals or so-called backslidden uh, children of theirs. And when I say children, guys, I'm talking about some older adults, children. And when, they, when I'm talking about their children, I'm talking about these 19, 20, 21, some of like I told you guys, some of them are married, got their own kids. But the parents just want them to, if they can just get back in church, no, 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 no. So that's why I try to explain this whole thing to them about how look at it through God's eye. You know, church is his people. You know, so if they have a relationship with the Lord, that's awesome. Now, if they do decide to want to come to church and come there to worship, praise the Lord, hear a message from the pastor, then great. But this whole thing of you trying to go after them or you trying to save them, you're going to find yourself going through a lot of heartache and pain because one, they're definitely going to be defensive about you trying to force them and make them come and do something that they don't want to do. And two, they know within themselves, and I'm talking about 90% of the time, they know within themselves that they do have a relationship with God. They know within themselves that they are following the principles that you actually established in them as kids. But there are some that actually are, they, they totally go in another direction. Something might have happened to them while they were attending church that hurt them. A pastor, a minister, an evangelist, a, a teacher, a deacon, any of it. Some of these kids, I'm talking, when I say kids, guys, again, I'm talking about older adults. They've been hurt by somebody in the church. So the minute they got on their own, they're leaving, you know, and a lot of a lot of people that I've talked to before, they get tired of being in type in the type of religious type environment, you know, relationship versus religion is a huge division within the church. Most churches, when you get involved in them, I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of churches that you come into, you know, you get hit with the rules and the guidelines. And I mean, even from the beginning, you can look at some of the websites. They say, we believe in the da 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 da. So even before you even set foot in there, they pretty much telling you these are our rules, whatever like that. So not to knock any of that. I'm just saying there's a lot of people that done some what I call eating and regurgitating or rinse and repeat. They've done what other churches have done or they've done what other ministers have done without actually questioning whether this is actually something that's from God. Because um, when it all comes down to it, nothing is going to matter more than relationship. Now, I'm not telling nobody not to go and visit church or not to go and worship. I'm definitely not saying anything like that because some people like to, you know, you go down and worship with the one mind, one accord, being around like brothers and sisters, the fellowship and all that. That's all great. But what I'm talking about when it all comes down to it is that the relationship that you have with God is way more and it far outweighs and it's far superior than you being seen a certain amount of times at the church building. Like, again, I'm not knocking going to church and worshiping God and praising the Lord with the saints and hearing the music and hearing something from God and being around saints. You might get some edification from different people around you, whatever like that, that they may have. So, you know, help strengthen you. But my point in saying all that is, is just because you don't see them there does not mean that they're not with him. You know what I mean? I mean, it really can just throw a lot of people off when I tell them this, because they've been taught that same mindset is that, um, my child has not been attending church. So that means that, oh, my God, the devil is busy, guys. I've said this over and over and over again. And you can disagree with me if you want. It doesn't matter. Once God revelates things to you, you're going to find out that man being in him is such a rest. There's such peace. There's such is joy. I'm not saying this as no cliche thing I'm talking about when you get a hold of God really and you establish a relationship with him and he begins to speak to you through your conscience and everything like that and gets you to see things in a whole different perspective it eliminates so much nonsense in your life that you can't help but walk around with joy and peace and love in your heart so the reason why I say all that is because some people try to make you feel like you have to work for it when they don't even know that Christ already died for it you get what I'm saying why are you trying to work to save yourself? Why are you trying to work so hard to be a good Christian when you don't have to do that? The Holy Spirit will do that. You just have to sit back and just do nothing. Continue to be who you are while Christ is making you into who he wants you to be. You know, so yeah, I know a lot of things like church makes it hard. You got seminars, you got these symposiums, you got your 16 day fast to a new outlook. You got your yeah, I don't know. They got all kind of things, you know, double for your trouble. Like one pastor said, a triple for your ripple, you know, take back what the cockroach stole. All you got all these cliches getting thrown around. You know, what is that? What does that even mean? 
when somebody say go and take back what the devil stole for him, what do you actually do? But people do get excited in church when they hear things like that, don't they? Go back and take what the devil stole from you. The devil actually cannot steal nothing from you, but you can hand things over to him. Y'all didn't know this? Check the Bible. It's written in the Bible that Christ defeated the devil at the cross. So then you need to ask yourself, who are you fighting? You might have gotten instigated into a fight that was already won. You've been instigated into a fight that you were already victorious over. Now, I tell this all the time, and I say this in my uh, live chats before is this. We was on a basketball team that we were definitely, we were dominant. I mean, we were dominant. We were just undefeated, right? So we were going to play this team that was an Amish basketball team. And we're sitting there thinking like, get out of here. And I can tell you, it was just like, okay, we about to play this Amish team. Like, really? It was like, this is going to be nothing. These dudes probably, you know, this is going to be nothing. So we got there and guess what? We were like pretty much twice the size of their whole basketball team. So we got there, we laxed days, we shooting around. Oh man, this is going to be so fun. We about to have some fun. Next thing you know, by the time the fourth quarter rolled around, they was beating us by like 15 points. And then we ended up losing to them by like eight points. And that was a long, cold, quiet bus ride on the way back home. And what ended up happening is this. We trying to figure out how in the world did we lose? How did we lose to somebody that we know? I mean, we, we, we crushing teams that were known to be the dominant teams in the, in the city. You know what I mean? Or around the surrounding Big 12 area. We're crushing these teams. So how in the world do we lose to an Amish basketball team? Well, you know what happened? We got there. They actually made us play at their level. And they beat us at their level. And we lost. Although we've been beating these big teams left and right easily. But we lost to a team that was like 0-10. And we end up being there one in 10. They, and it's like, you know, of course, they went nuts and crazy because they beat us. But my point in saying all that is if Christ already defeated the devil at the cross, then why are we fighting? I'm not. I'm not. Once this has been revelated to me, I stopped doing everything. I was I stopped trying to, you know, oh, the devil. I mean, we, we these things get tossed around so much. People say it all the time. You know, the devil is busy and the devil is out there. He come to steal, kill, and destroy. Yeah, that is in the Bible that it does say that. But like I said, when Christ died at the cross, it's in the Bible that he defeated the devil at the cross. So you have to ask yourself, who is it that you got in? in who is it? And what is it that caused you to get instigated into this fight that you were already victorious over? You just don't get involved in it. That's why I say when you guys see me talk about certain things, I just y'all seen it. The comments that fly at me, the negative comments, the bad mouth and how I'm able to just to flick it off because I beat that. Uh, I'm not about to sit here and fight something that I've already beat. It's just like, you know, you know, if I if, if I've conquered all my enemies and I have them in jail and they're locked up and they're sitting there fussing and yelling at me, what do I look like going to them? They, they're, they're telling me, dude, I can take you. I can beat you. I'm like, look, you're already locked up in jail. What do I need to argue with you? I'm not even going to argue with you. They know you can't beat me. I'm not going to argue with you. But what sense does it make that I made them talk? Th I made these people that I've already defeated. They're, they're already locked up. I allowed them to get in my head to cause me to go over there and unlock the key and let all of them out. And now I'm dealing with all this, this stress and this depression and this anxiety and this agoraphobia and dealing with this, you know, antisocial, dealing with ADD, ADHD. I'm dealing with all these psychological issues because I actually allowed them to come in. You have no idea how powerful your mind is. I don't care. See, the trick behind this is that, I mean, I don't knock psychiatrists, psychologists. I got friends that are like that. I got doctors that are like that. People who got their double PhDs in psychology that I talk to all the, you know, we've talked to before. Um, and they flat out told me and my wife, this doctor who has a double PhD, she's a neuropsychologist and actually sat there and said, I come to the conclusion that this is a spiritual thing. I can only help these people or I can only help their symptoms, but I can actually treat the root cause of it. And she actually was having me and my wife help her with the issues, because I'm telling you, I don't care what not, you know, I don't care if people believe me or not. But the thing is, I know when people get help and it hits them on a spiritual level, all of a sudden they feel like they've been lifted of their depression. They're being lifted of their anxiety. They've been lifted of their agoraphobia when they're scared to go amongst people because something actually convinced you something actually deceived you into letting it in and having you believe this and now you seeing it under a different set of eyes and now everything seems really weird you know what i mean it's just like how you know i'm just being honest with you guys there was a group of people that was in our church that they attended you know before when they started to attend our church they were told by their um family member or members that they were taught a certain thing about black people 
They were. But what it ended up doing, I mean, they, they tell us, they told us every story that the, their, uh, their family members told them about blacks. So they, were, they actually started seeing blacks in a whole different way.